que le franchise. So we are live. Okay. Let's see. Let's see what, how many participants. So let me see if I appear. Yes. Yes. I appear in the screen. Very good. <laughs> yeah, there is an initial uh, exponential growth of participants, and yeah, then such rates. Yeah. One should, uh, I think, take data and see what is the curve. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> okay, number for each are 50 and right, 50 and right. Good. A hundred. Yeah, yeah. Now it be a thousand and then everything will collapse. <laughs> yeah. There is a, I think depends on your zoom license a lot of times yes, 300 sure. is the maximum sure yes we have a, uh, uh, i think we have a, a 300 license yeah. yes yes because sometimes we we have to open a a youtube, Second, a, yeah. a, a youtube channel for for those who cannot connect and so on. Yeah. David, we see the second screen on zoom ah so we see also the, the next slide okay I will okay. As soon as we as you have the solve the same problem, I can start. I think that you just need to double the screen. You need to unshare uh, this uh, monitor. I need to with the option of Zoom, but uh, on the downside. Okay, you have stopped video. Oh, it's unique because we need to choose another another screen. Unfortunately, I, I have to share. The station council is going on. Mm, uh, you should and choose desktop too. Mm. Mm. And then in Keynote, I go here. Okay. It's okay. Okay. And now you see this one. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. It's uh, since we are later. It's a real pleasure to introduce Professor Sperger from Flat Island, New York. Uh, uh, it's a, he's an amazing and astonishing figure in his field. And uh, he, uh, so he's a scientific personality will be introduced by Carlo. I would like just uh, to tell that, uh, that I'm really honored to have you here. And uh, we had time to, to, to to chat briefly yesterday uh, about the COVID crisis. And uh, this is in fact the first hybrid conference that we held, that we hold and uh, uh, in the series. So you are a newcomer to this <laughs> new series uh, that is the hybrid colloquium series. And, uh, and uh, we'll be very happy to listen to, to your talk and I leave the floor to Carlo for the the more scientific introduction. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Stefano, for this uh, nice introduction. And again, thank you, David, for, for being here with us. It's a honor for, for the school and, uh, and it, it is an event which, which, uh, which uh, possesses a special meaning given the times and given the, the new hope that we are sort of seeing. So I, I can spend a few words of introduction for, for, for David and it could be, they will be in any case incomplete because it is really difficult to describe fully a personality which, which made uh, modern cosmology uh, together with a few other colleagues uh, as, it is, uh, as it is today. I can, I can mention uh, the uh, fundamental lead in one of the major steps in cosmology ahead, which is the, the, the uh, coordination of uh, 
of the analysis of the Wilkinson microwave anisotropy probe. And, uh, and uh, with, with the coordination of the actual analysis, uh, but also um, fundam let's say, um, fundamental research works, which uh, identify new directions and, um, and uh, uh, indicated new methodologies that everybody is using at this moment in phenomenology and uh, interpretation and analysis of, of, of the data. Um, at this moment, um, um, he's, uh, he's one of the personalities leading major efforts in cosmology for the, for the new decay. So in a time scale of, uh, of a few, few years, in 2022, the Simons Observatory should be taking light into, into the Atacama Desert and uh, making a fundamental attempt for the detection of primordial gravitational waves, including uh, everything that comes later in the light. So we are really looking forward uh, to, to, this, to this effort and to have the guidance of David uh, for, for, this, uh, for all the science which is coming. So for this, we, we, so we decided to have this, uh, this uh, uh, title, which is, uh, which is very appropriate for the, the um, um, uh, coverage of topics that David uh, possesses for, for cosmology and also gives, uh, gives the idea of a hope that we, everybody's having looking at a post-pandemic world in which we can push forward uh, our projects as we did almost heroically in these uh, a year and a half, one year and a half, okay, coming back together in gatherings. So new avenues for all these, uh, these meetings. David will be here for, for one week and um, he's director of the Flatiron Institute uh, in uh, New York. And uh, starting in June, he'll be the president of the Simon Foundation. So I leave the floor to David. Thank you again for being here. Thank you. And uh, with the permission of the handful of people who are here, I want to take off yeah. my mask. Permission and uh, been tested three times in the past 72 hours, so I'm pretty good. And two vaccines. Um, and say what a pleasure it is to be here. And this is my first trip since actually February 2020. And uh, actually, as I'll mention in the talk, it's actually my first trip outside the US since the Nobel Prize ceremony when I saw Jim Peebles win his Nobel Prize uh, at the end of uh, 2019. And it's uh, wonderful to be here to talk with colleagues to meet the uh, some of the students here and to really feel the revival of international science. I think we have all missed each other. Zoom has been, we've done the best we can with the Zoom. And, and you know, I want to take this moment to really salute, salute everyone who has persevered through these uh, difficult times in so many different ways. Uh, but now, as Paulo said, I want to look forward and look forward to this coming decade, which will really be a very exciting time in cosmology. And in doing that, what, the approach I want to take is in order to look forward, I think one first needs to look back and ask, what have we learned? This gives us a chance to review where we are in cosmology. For the cosmologists, I think this will be all familiar, but I think it's an important place to start. And then talk about how we can probe the early universe with our observations, the cosmic microwave background. Talk about ways we could search for new physics with the observations. And for me, this defines the direction we want to go is experiments and observations that will give us insight into new fundamental physics, and then just highlight some of the next generation of experiments. And I particularly, you know, when uh, in giving talks, focuses on things that you're involved with. So I will talk primarily about the Simons Observatory, um, but also about the Roman Space Telescope, which I'll talk more about. So what have we learned? We've learned that in some ways a remarkably simple model, as I'll show as we go through the data, does an incredible job of fitting the data. A model with five basic numbers, the density of atoms, the density of matter, the age of the universe, 
how lumpy it is, the amplitude of fluctuations, and how that lumpiness varies with scale, the slope of the primordial spectrum. Those five numbers fit all of our data. There's a few interesting tensions, but things basically fit, and that's remarkable. And for me, one of the incredible experiences has been watching the data improve. And through my involvement in WMAP, I had the true privilege of being among the first people to make our measurements and to make the plots and compare it to the model. And with our first data, the simple model fit. And that our data continued to improve over the subsequent nine years. And the model continued to fit. And then the Planck results came with higher precision. And the same model continued to fit. And we got data on small scales, as I'll talk about with the Atacama Cosmology Telescope. And the model still fit remarkably well. And what's exciting, in a sense, to get to the summary of my talk, in the coming decade, we will take data with even higher precision. And the question will be, will the simple model fit? And more excitingly, do we find deviations, and particularly deviations that will give us insight into the fundamental physics? And while these things uh, model fits, it's also a very strange model. We should not forget the strangeness. It is a model in which atoms make up 5% of the universe. The rest of the universe is in the form of dark matter and dark energy both of which require new physics beyond the standard model. We see these very simple, nearly scale invariant fluctuations that we'll discuss. Uh, we don't, you know, we have ideas for their origin, but we don't understand the physics of inflation. And finally, we don't understand why, you know, the other parameter, the baryon density, we don't understand why there's more baryons and antibaryons. We have ideas for these things. But all these pieces require physics beyond the standard model. So we know as cosmologists, we are really probing things that can give us new insights into fundamental physics. And as I mentioned already, my uh, last time out of the United States was I was in, had the pleasure of being in Stockholm to see my colleague Jim Peebles win the Nobel Prize for his work on cosmology. And he was one of the you know, primary pioneers who developed the theoretical underpinnings for much of the model we'll talk about uh, in the first part of the talk. So let me start with the data, that, or one piece of the data that gives us so much confidence of the success of the model. And what's plotted here is the amplitude of fluctuations, the variance in the power spectrum as a function of multiple moments. And we'll go through the details of what we mean here, but you can just think of this as the variance as a function of angular scale, going from the largest scales to the smallest scales. And here plotted in blue was the data first from Planck and then from ground-based experiments, the ACT experiment, the South Pole Telescope, polar bear and bicep two in Keck. These are two are in Chile, these two at the South Pole. And the first takeaway from this is the remarkable agreement between the experiments. This is a great experimental success. And one that I, you know, as a theorist who has worked with these teams over the years, I need to always use this six time to express my admiration for the experimentalists who have measured with tremendous precision these fluctuations at the level of micro Kelvin squared. I mean, this is our unit. And here we're looking at measurements really at the nano Kelvin squared level. And what we're plotting here, and we'll go through this, are measurements of the temperature power spectrum the polarization power spectrum, the B mode pa BB power spectrum, and the temperature polarization cross spectrum. And all these measurements with the different experiments 
in the power spectrum are green. If we look at it on the sky, mode by mode, they also, the different experiments agree remarkably well. And uh, then the next thing to note is the theory curves. And this is our theoretical model. And there's a lot of redundancy here. One can take the Planck data, fit the best fit model to the temperature spectrum, and then go compare that to measurements of polarization. And it again fits remarkably well. And then go compare it to observations of a large scale structure of the galaxies without any free parameters, the model fits. And this kind of precision measurements have transformed the way many of us think about cosmology. So what do we see in the microwave atom? So I wanna now talk about the basic features of CMB physics. So first, as I mentioned, we have dark matter and baryons and photons. We start with fluctuations that are what we call adiabatic. By that, we mean the amount of dark, ratio of dark matter to photons, baryons to photons is the same everywhere in space. And what varies is the overall density of the universe. So one patch has more dark matter, it also has more photons, it has more variants. And when you start with that, that gives a very characteristic form to the power spectrum. We see peaks in the spectrum. This first peak in the temperature at the scale of about a degree, an anti-correlation between temperature and polarization. The next polarization peak here, we would see a different pattern with isocurvature fluctuations. And oops. Uh, by looking at the patterns and the ratios of these peaks, we learn about how the fluctuations evolve. And, uh, there's a little delay between the two screens, which I don't fully understand. Oh, sorry. There we go. Um, so once we start with these initial fluctuations, we evolve them forward in time. The basic elements of the theory go back to work by Peoples and Zinyev and Zoldovich over 40 years ago. We have numerical codes to evolve this and now agreed to better than uh, fractions of percent. And the basic physics is the fluctuations in dark matter grow by gravity. And the fluctuations in baryons and photons behave like a fluid, they're tightly coupled, and they oscillate. And the patterns of hot and cold spots and the patterns you see in the power spectrum are determined by how the wavelength evolves uh, and whether or not the contributions from the cold dark matter and the baryons and photons are either in phase or out of phase. And the basic physics is also determined by the evolution of the ionization of the universe. The universe starts out fully ionized around a redshift of 1100. It undergoes a transition from being dominated by radiation, uh, to being ionized to being neutral. When that happens, the universe becomes transparent to the, to the cosmic background radiation and the photons propagate freely to us. When we look at these maps of the microwave background, and this shows the data from WMAP and the data from Planck. And again, you should notice the remarkable agreement between them. These pictures do not do justice to Planck in a sense because the data from Planck is so high resolution that these pictures don't have the resolution to show the really fine details, which you will see Planck picks up. What we do with these maps is we take them, we expand them in spherical harmonics. The universe seems to be isotropic and Gaussian. So all of the information is carried in the spherical harmonics. We measure the angular power spectrum in the spherical harmonics. We often express it in this form where we weight it by L squared. So we have the variance per scale. And again, as I noted, Planck and WMAP see the same sky. This is, you know, remarkable, right? I mean, this is a great success. And in fact, Planck really is, in some ways, two experiments on the same instrument, 
the low-frequency low instrument and the high-frequency instrument. So we have three all-sky surveys that are quite independent that agree. And when we look multiple by multiple, here's part of the cross-correlation between uh, Planck and WMAP in the black and then Planck alone in the red. And you can see the Planck error bars are smaller at large multiple small scales, but multiple by multiple. In detail, they agree. And this agreement is also there when we look at our small scale experiments. So this shows the ACT experiment in Chile at 148 gigahertz and the Planck experiment at 143. On the ground, you can build bigger dishes. So experiments like ACT, South Pole Telescope and the upcoming Simons Observatory have finer resolution. So they can see details one can't see from space, but are more prone to systematics, particularly on larger angular scales. So the combination of the two is what's most powerful. But again, to see these independent experiments using very different technologies, um, see the same fluctuations is uh, a great success. And again, this just shows the, the fit between all the models and the data and all the pieces really come together. Now I've been talking primarily about fluctuations in temperature, but we also see fluctuations in polarization. And the polarization pattern we see on the sky can actually be decomposed into two types of modes. Any polarization pattern could be decomposed into E modes, which are symmetric under mirror reflection, and B modes, which are anti-symmetric. Variations in the density of the universe, because they're a scalar field, should give rise to only E modes. And if the universe was homogeneous and we just saw the microwave background, if you know there, we would see only E modes in the sky. There are several ways of generating B modes. Most excitingly, gravitational waves can, uh, in the early universe can generate B modes and be a potential signal of, of the physics from the early universe. We could also generate uh, B modes by also uh, any vector perturbations uh, or things like uh, uh, you know a churn Simons term that would rotate E modes into B modes the photons propagate. But the conventional way, way we actually see the B modes as far as we best understand it, is as light propagates from the surface of glass scattered to us, it is deflected in its path by gravitational lensing. That deflection converts E modes somewhat into B modes, it rotates them a bit. So when we look at the microwave sky, we see a B mode signal um, and that you saw in the data. Now, when we look at polarization patterns and temperature patterns, we can really see the pattern of acoustic waves. And this figure from uh, one of the client papers, kind of following some things that uh, we did for WMAP, um, shows how you can take that map you saw of the sky, stack the map on cold and hot spots. So we've taken the data and taken every cold spot on the map and we've stacked on the cold spot. And every cold spot, which represents a region with more dark matter, hence the gravitational potential is deeper. So the photons have to climb out of the deep well. So that's stacked on excess cold dark excess dark matter, is surrounded by a hot ring. And that's because we start with these adiabatic fluctuations. So regions that have excess dark matter have start with excess baryons. But what happens can be shown here, if I create a region of excess pressure, a sound wave moves out. And that sound wave moves, travels, the speed of sound at the age of the universe, close to the speed of light over root three, and it moves outwards for about 380,000 years, um, which is the age of the universe at which it makes the transition uh, from being ionized to neutral. And you have this hot ring around every cold spot. And just by looking at this image of a hot ring around cold spots and symmetrically a cold ring around hot spots, we can actually measure by eye the basic properties of the universe. The fact that there's this cold spot tells us that there's cold dark matter. 
there's a component that's not coupled to the baryons and photons. Dark matter is non-baryonic. The ratio of the depth of this cold spot to the strength of this hot ring tells us the ratio of dark matter to photons. The, rate, the width of this ring tells us how the photons diffuse relative to the electrons and gives us a measure of the ratio of baryons to photons. The angular scale subtended by this ring gives us a measurement of the age of the universe. As we know this distance, and we propagate to us, you me we measure the angle, we know the distance they propagate. So just from this figure, we can determine all the cosmological parameters. Now in practice, we do a statistical analysis where we fit to the multiple spectrum rather than do the analysis here, but you can see everything here by eye. And here is the uh, observed polarization pattern. And below are the theoretical predictions. And this is an analysis done with the ACT data, where this compares the data to the predictions of the Lambda CDM model. And you can see it agrees nicely. And this is the best you can do fitting it with dark, without dark energy. And this is the best you can do fitting it without dark matter. So you can see by eye, we see evidence for dark energy and dark matter. And while the CMB is an important probe, we really have multiple probes of large scale structure. So in addition to the temperature, we've got the temperature and polarization, but also observations of the acoustic fluctuations. The same sound waves produce a pattern in the large scale distribution of galaxies. And these patterns of density fluctuations were really exactly what was predicted by Sinyaev and Zoldovich back in 1970. And this shows an abstract from their paper. And uh, as they said, this detailed study of the fluctuate of the pattern spectrum fluctuations may lead to an understanding of the nature of initial density perturbations, since a distinct periodic dependence of the density of perturbations on wavelength is peculiar to adiabatic perturbations. And that's what they saw in their abstract, is what we've seen in the microwave sky, and what we've seen in large scale structure. And this plot here, taken from the Planck 2015 data, shows how we can measure with this pattern uh, in the galaxy correlation function of how the galaxies are clustered we can use the same acoustic scale, the same ruler set by a sound wave to measure the, uh, the relationship between distance and redshift and check our measurements of expansion. And this is consistent with our, uh, the dark energy being all due to a cosmological constant. So how can we use this to probe the early universe? Well, first, we can use the fact that we see these anti-correlations between temperature and polarization. This was true back in the WMAP data to show that the fluctuations are super horizon. What do we mean by that? What we mean is that whatever physics generated these fluctuations on large angular scales had to either requires one of two things, either these large angular correlations on scales that are not interacting in the normal expanding universe model, we're either put in, in or there at the moment of the Big Bang, or we're, the universe needs to undergo a period of superluminal expansion, which we call inflation, where these two regions that were cause, seemingly causally disconnected came into contact. So just because we see this anti-correlation here, that tells us we must either have inflation or some kind of pre-Big Bang model. And there's interest, lots of people have developed bouncing models. There are various alternatives, but most people in the cosmology uh, community focus on the inflationary universe model. And you know, the inflationary universe model makes a number of key predictions. It said the fluctuation should be adiabatic, should be close to scale invariant, but in the simplest versions of it, it should be have a little more power on large scales than small scales. And this shows measurements combining WMAP and ACT. We have the first, I think, hints of this 
with, uh, well, you know, the sort of four to five sigma level with W map. Now, by the time we get to the Planck data, we're better than sort of seven sigma. We have really definitive evidence that the spectral index variates from, from one, which is in the context of inflation showing the infoton field rolling down the potential. We're actually seeing physics at the very early universe. Another key prediction of the inflationary model is that the fluctuations are Gaussian and isotropic. One nice way of seeing that they're Gaussian is you can just look at the number of pixels as a function of the variance. And this black curve is what measurements back from WMAP days with uh, the fluctuations compared to a histogram that's a Gaussian. So this is a zero parameter fit. And then we can smooth it. This is at the quarter degree scale, the half degree scale, the one degree scale. And on all these scales, it looks Gaussian. We can be more quantitative with this Gaussianity. And one way to do this is to measure the three point function of the temperature. This is often expressed in terms of things like F and L. And Planck has done this with pretty high, with high precision and everything seems quite consistent with Gaussian aid. And uh, with the Planck maps, the constraints are really uh, pretty compelling and effectively say that the level of non Gaussian is below a part in 10 to the fourth. And another way of looking at the non Gaussian is in terms of things like Minkowski functionals. We can look at the shape of the spots. And again, this is from the Planck results we see things very consistent with Gaussian aid. So where do we go next? As I've said, the inflationary models predict that uh, a flat universe, a nearly scale invariant one, an adiabatic one, Gaussian fluctuations, all those we've seen. And what is the next smoking gun, the next real test for the model, and one that will tell us a great deal about the physics of inflation if we were to see it, is we'd like to see the stochastic background of gravitational waves produced in the early universe. Of course, there's been a lot of excitement about gravitational waves for good reason uh, with the results from LIGO and Virgo. Those have shown us gravitational waves produced by the mergers of compact objects in the, re in the recent universe. Here, we're looking at gravitational waves, we're looking for gravitational waves that would have been generated in the first moments of after the Big Bang. And one of the big drivers for the next generation of experiments is the search of gravitational waves. And the idea here is during inflation, um, you have any massless field experiencing quantum fluctuations. That's also true of gravitational waves. And the amplitude of the signal is just gonna depend on the expansion rate of the universe at that early moment and effectively gives us a measurement of the scale of inflation. And uh, we often express this in terms of parameter R, which is the scale of inflation compared to sort of a gut scale. One way to think about these gravitational waves is they're closely related to phenomena like Hawking radiation, where you have a black hole horizon giving us uh, quantum modes, quantum excitation of massless modes. Um, similarly, we have a horizon in the inflationary universe that also generates gravitational waves, and that's what we're searching for. So how do we search for them? Well, let me remind you again of we can split things into E modes and B modes. Our variations in density generate only E modes initially, and on large angular scales, gravitational waves are the way we expect to see B-modes. So here is our predicted signals. This shows gravitational waves generated, generating signals at redshift of 1,000. Here's the signal generated closer to redshift of 10. And in purple are our lensing signals. And what we know this level very well, because we imagine 
the amplitude of uh, density fluctuations, the pink signal is known. What we don't know is where we should be looking for this blue signal. What level are we, are we, uh, does the universe give us? We have uh, constraints on it, and there have been attempts to see it. This is the picture from the bicep data where there were claims of gravitational waves uh, about seven years ago. And this actually is a nice figure in that it shows you the swirly nature of the B-modes. Unfortunately, this was measured only at one frequency. So you're seeing the nature of modes generated by galactic dust, which is a source of confusion. By looking at multiple frequencies, we can remove that and uh, look for what's there. So here's where we are at the moment with B modes. This shows the current measurements from BICEP and uh, combined with Planck, um, some of the other experiments. Um, you see the signal here is completely consistent with the expected signal from lensing. This shows a fit to the amplitude of the lensing signal and the tensor the scalar to tensor ratio, and the data is completely consistent with no gravitational wave signal at the moment. One can rule out R less than about 0.08. And what is the frontier that I'll get to, we'll talk about for future experiments is to push those limits further. It'd be very exciting to see this. It would be a glimpse into the universe's first 10 to the minus, not 10 to 30 seconds, but 10 to the minus 30 seconds. Uh, we're probing physics near the Planck scale. We would see direct evidence for gravitons and the quantum nature of a gravitational field. It would open up a new area of cosmology. We can search for new physics. So I'm going to move more quickly through the new physics so I can talk about the experiments. Among those things we can search for are neutrino physics. We've already constrained the number of relativistic degrees of freedom. We can provide strong constraints on the sum of neutrino masses. And I think we'll be able to determine with the combination of microwave background measurements and some of the large scale structure measurements that I'm going to talk about soon, um, the whole neutrino hierarchy. One of the things we don't know about neutrinos is are the neutrinos we know have mass. We know the difference between the neutrino mass states but we don't know whether we're looking at something with a normal hierarchy like this, with two light species and one heavy one, or an inverted hierarchy like this. We don't know the structure of the neutrino masses. And right now we have constraints from large scale, uh, from experiments, ground based experiments. We have some we have constraints from cosmology that do not yet distinguish between the inverted hierarchy and the normal hierarchy. To me, what is one of the exciting things about the next generation of experiments, the ones I'm going to talk about in the uh, final part of my talk, is that we will have error bars small enough that we can make measurements that sit here, or measurements that sit here. And we will make a definitive measurement of one of the fundamental parameters of our universe. What is the mass of the neutrinos and what are its properties? Well, how will we do this? Well, the 2020s will be a, a decade of really a data explosion in cosmology. We have a number of remarkable experiments, some already underway, some that will be launched quite soon. Uh, Irozita, which is a German-Russian uh, collaboration uh, the experiment has been launched into space. It is already mapping the entire sky in the X-ray, giving us a picture of clusters of galaxies and how they're distributed across the universe. Will actually be a wonderful data set to combine with these other data sets here. Um, Desi. Um, which is a, uh, a spectroscopic survey that is measuring the positions of galaxies. I showed you that data from the Sloan survey, which showed where the baryon acoustic oscillations are. DESI will use the same approach to measure 
but with much higher precision, um, how the galaxies are distributed, giving us a way of measuring the relationship between distance and redshift. That's a direct probe of the effects of dark energy. It will help us determine whether or not dark energy is indeed a cosmological constant due to vacuum energy, or dark energy is some dynamical field that's evolving. Uh, it'll be complemented by uh, lensing data from things, the Vera Rubin Observatory, which will survey the sky and the ground and the optical. Euclid, which will carry out uh, two programs, both an imaging program and a spectroscopic program. So we'll be measuring uh, both the relationship between distance and redshift and how structure evolves. And then a few years later, NASA will launch the Roman telescope, an even larger telescope that will make these same kinds of measurements, um, but geared towards higher redshift as it will be operating primarily in the infrared. And then a project that, uh, well, you know, both the group here at CESA and our group in Flatiron and my collaborators at Princeton are involved with is a big international collaboration that we call the Simons Observatory that uh, I think realistically we'll see first light in 23. We've been carrying 22, but like many things, COVID has slowed things down somewhat. And uh, since I'm about now foundation president and have to worry about budget overruns because of COVID delays, um, I try to put in schedule realism now. And uh, this is something I began with, with a picture there where we saw this, I think this evolution as we go to smaller scales where we will have what I really view as a successor to, in terms of the surveys we've done to what's come out of Plum, where with Simon's Observatory, we will be surveying the sky with really two sets of telescopes. We have a large aperture telescope that will survey 40% of the sky one arc minute resolution, noise three times less than Planck, um, roughly three times less than ACT, and roughly 10 times less than Planck. So it's really an order of magnitude improvement in sensitivity, factor five res improvement in um, angular resolution, and covering a very significant portion of the sky. Planck, of course, covers the whole sky, um, and covering multiple frequencies. So we really ought to have that next generation max which will test all these ideas of higher precision. And then this large aperture telescope will be complemented by these small aperture telescopes. These small telescopes are really optimized to go after gravitational waves and measure the B modes on small scales. And what we've been engaged in is developing the whole path that works its way from detectors to building the telescope, the satellite, making measurements of the signal. And with these ground-based experiments, it's really remarkable. This is what you actually measure, which is fluctuations in each detector over time. The amplitude of the signal is measured not in micro Kelvin, but in tens of millikelvin. The atmosphere is uh, more than a a thousand times brighter than the temperature signal we're looking at, and a hundred thousand times brighter than the polarization signal we're looking at. And we have to take this signal, analyze it, produce maps, take those maps, and use them to learn cosmology. And people in the collaboration are really working on all these different pieces with a goal of really learning something new. By looking at these different pieces, we'll of course check our lambda CDM model, our basic cosmology, but ideally find new physics associated with neutrinos, dark matter, by looking for the effects of dark matter decay, um, dark energy, uh, seeing some of the signatures of reionization on some small scale. Um, you know, I, I recommend our science team paper, which really sketches out some of that physics. With a project of this scope, we have a large team. So this is uh, 
our paper describing science goals and forecasts. And we have uh, collaborators um, everywhere from South Africa to Chile, United States to Canada, and many parts of Europe, Japan, uh, all working together to ena enable the science. And uh, the group here at CSEF is an important part of this international team. And uh, we're hoping uh, to actually get first light this well next year. I think it's not going to be this year. Um, it's not. It's a, an ambitious experiment. Um, it's the largest funded ground-based experiment. And it's one that, uh, putting my hat on as president of the Simons Foundation, we're providing the bulk of the money. Um, and uh, just again, show you pictures of the small aperture telescope, the large aperture telescope. And now I'm gonna to turn to uh, what's gonna happen, not just in the microwave background, but go back to what's happening with, um, oh, I've got two slides out of order. We'll skip it, that's what I was looking for, sorry. This is just to show you uh, for the Simons Observatory, it's not just uh, uh, blueprints, but actual things being built. Here are our detectors. Here is the enormous uh, doer for the large aperture telescope with the team at the University of Pennsylvania working at it on it. Here's the small aperture telescope with a team at UC San Diego working at it on it. The large aperture telescope is being assembled as we speak in Germany and will be shipped soon. And uh, we'll um, look for it being on the sky. So now let me switch back and talk more about future progress on the ground. Uh, people here in Europe have heard a lot about Euclid, which will be a wonderful telescope that will uh, launch hopefully in the next two years and we'll map the whole sky um, at uh, and measure images in the optical with some infrared sensitivity to get redshifts and do spectroscopy. W first will represent the next step beyond it. I think in some ways it's a relationship similar to W map and Planck where we'll go with even higher sensitivity and precision with a larger telescope uh, and map the sky. The W first mission was how, what we called it when we were developing it, uh, the Wide Field Infrared Survey Telescope. NASA recently renamed this after one of the pioneers of space astronomy, uh, Nancy Grace Roman. Nancy Grace Roman was the first head of astronomy at NASA and uh, the person who was the uh, leader at NASA that helped enable Kobe Hubble and many of the tel other telescopes that really defined uh, the uh, space astronomy uh, in, the uh, in the past several decades. And, uh, It was not letting me advance. Oh, there we go. There we go. So the Roman telescope has an interesting life story. It started as a spy telescope. It was part of a series of telescopes that were, of which the Hubble was part of. Um, you know, the U.S. government has built of order twenty Hubble-sized telescopes. All the others up to now have pointed down. They're the keyhole telescopes, and you can look up their properties on Wikipedia. And about um, 15 years ago, they were developing the next generation of these telescopes. And uh, there were all sorts of problems in this next generation telescope. And there were very large overruns in the program. 
and the, na the uh, National Reconnaissance Organization decided to cancel the program. And these telescopes were in storage at a time at which the astronomy community was developing its plans to do a wide field infrared survey. And some of the engineers who built these telescopes realized they had in storage telescopes that were really ideal for what the astronomy community wanted. So after uh, a number of uh, co somewhat complex pol internal politics, these telescopes were transferred to NASA. And this really was in a sense, swords be turned into plowshares, right? That this was uh, telescopes that were meant to look down, uh, converted into a more powerful telescope than what we initially thought, hoped we could build, aimed to look up. So these are Hubble-sized telescopes with a field of view that is 100 times bigger than Hubble. So every image you've seen from Hubble, now make it 100 times bigger. Because it's sitting not in low Earth orbit, it'll be launched out to L2 where Planck is and where uh, JWST will go. This telescope will be able to survey the sky several hundred times faster than Hubble. So realistically ought to be able to survey the entire sky in the, uh, the lifetime of the, the telescope. And we're launching the telescope with uh, two main instruments, a wide field imager with visible to near infrared pass bands, a field of view of about 0.281 square degrees, with 18 4K by 4K detectors, those detectors which were the most challenging technology have now all been built to all meet uh, the requirements. There'll also be a chronograph that will uh, be designed to develop the technologies to uh, look for extrasolar planets, eventually make steps towards detecting planets like Earth. And to give a sense of where things are going, uh, in terms of sensitivities, the Sloan telescope on this unit is about up here. These are, you know, we're, uh, and we're looking at many orders of magnitude improvement as we go to the Euclid survey here in green, which will have angular resolution. This is the angular resolution in milli arc seconds, very high resolution in the visible across this wide band with infrared colors. After 10 years of operation, so one year of operation of the Vera Rubin telescope puts it at about Euclid sensitivity. So one, the way I think of this is in 2023, we want to be combining data from the Vera Rubin observatory in the optical and UV with Euclid data, which is higher angular resolution. Notice the factor of more than three higher angular resolution than you get from uh, LSST to make an image of the sky there. And towards the end of the decade, we'll be working with, this is 10 years worth of LSST, of the real Rubin Observatory data, and data from uh, the Roman telescope. Two significant changes in the Roman telescope that are really ends up being enhancements. We've been able to add an infrared uh, detector, uh, infrared filter, so that we can take advantage of the telescope's capabilities at what K short to survey the sky. And we've been exploring use of its very wide band, learning lessons from Euclid, which is we'll be using its wide band in the visible to use a wide band in the infrared. And with this wide band in the infrared, we should be able to cover the entire LSST footprint uh, in uh, only four months at that depth. Um, so it will be, you know, very complementary uh, to Euclid, which will be in its spectroscopic survey focused on sort of redshifts one and a half and less. W first is really more focused on one and a half to three. And in its imaging survey, uh, W first will be looking at the infrared universe. 
And uh, this just shows you again, uh, for Roman, I think the takeaway image to have is this one. This shows the size of its detectors and what it images in a single image versus what Hubble images. So you could think of every Hubble image you've ever seen, make it 200 times bigger. And you can see how we can go from a telescope like Hubble, which has done wonderful things, but only surveyed about a percent of the sky in its 25 year lifetime to a telescope like the Roman telescope, which should be able to survey the whole sky. So what I wanna leave you with is I hope a sense of excitement, a uh, sense of excitement first that we're having hybrid talks that we're here in person. And it's been, just, it's been wonderful to have time to, to talk to people here and be in a room with colleagues and learn about the exciting science that they're doing and communicate ideas and uh, have espressos together again. And, uh, but also excitement about the coming decade in astronomy, where we're very fortunate to have these wonderful telescopes uh, coming and tremendous data. And I think now the, the challenge for us is to figure out what's the best way to get the most new science out of this data. What are the new questions we wanna ask? Um, how are ways to, we can extract uh, the most out of this uh, exciting data that's coming? So let me stop there and uh, take some questions. Thank you. Thank you, baby. We taking questions. I have some, but um, we can. Uh, there is a break from that over there. Okay, please, 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 thank you. From uh, Marcello Massardi. Mm -hmm. Many of the presented achievements were possible thanks. Mm -hmm. So, it's a question from Marcello Massardi. Um, she asks uh, Many of the presented achievements were possible thanks to the proper characterization of foregrounds. What do you think would be the more crucial challenge in foregrounds investigation to address the future cosmological goals? So we will be pushing forward in our measurements with satellite observatories, I think of it at two scales. On large angular scales, where we go look after B modes and small angular scales, where we're characterizing the physics of the fluctuations in, the, in, in temperature and polarization and higher precision. I think the foregrounds are really dominant on the large angular scales. And the challenge will be characterizing the galaxy to high precision and uh, being able to remove the contributions from dust and from synchrotron, both, both of which have polarized signals that are likely brighter, almost certainly brighter than the gravitational wave signals we want to look for. So I think the challenge will be to not only remove the foregrounds, but to be convinced, be able to convince first ourselves and others that we have removed the foregrounds with high enough precision that we understand the residuals. This is almost certainly true that after we remove the foregrounds, there'll be some residual signal. And we have to be sure that that residual signal is due to uh, gravitational waves and not due to our, our limitations in how to remove dust. And I think one of the complications will be, we do not know well how much the dust within our own galaxy, the shape of the dust spectrum varies from place to place, particularly along the line of sight. So you can imagine two types of dust grains, carbon aceous grains, silicate gate grains, and we remove primarily the signal from one and we're left with a signal from the other. And because the way we've removed it, we've changed the spectrum of the residual grain signal. And it's close enough to the thermal CMB spectrum to be a residual contaminant. And I think that will be the biggest challenge. 
And one of the things we've been talking about here is we have other information about the foregrounds. The foregrounds are highly non-Gaussian. They're highly anisotropic. They correlate with the large scale distribution of H1. They correlate with uh, things we can trace from maps like from the Planck high frequency maps. And we will need to show that any signal that we purportedly think might be due to gravitational waves do not correlate with any of these tracers. Uh, and in addition to foregrounds, we have to also worry about uh, experimental systematics. We have designed the experiment to be to minimize those systematics, but they will still be there and we'll need to understand them very well. This one don't see you, you, you get my, my, my chat messages. Yes, uh, so there are two questions uh, about uh, analyzing, analyzing data. Uh, I, will, uh, I will read the questions uh, together. One is from uh, Antonio Lanza. And uh, he asks, yeah, yeah. could you comment on the tools to analyze data? You had a slide saying whether we have the right tools. And the related question is from Roberto Trotta. Uh, thanks for a great talk, he says. You mentioned the data explosion that's upcoming. What role do you see for the new machine learning methods to decipher the cosmological information in the data? Well, this is something that I'm most excited about. And um, this actually gives me an opportunity to advertise my talk on Thursday, <laughs> um, which is at 11. At 11. And one of the things I want to talk about more is exactly what Roberto has, has asked about. So right now we have tools for analyzing both the large scale structure data and the microwave background data that primarily rely on measuring the two point function of the data. And this is something that we have developed really over the last 50 years as we understand very well how to analyze the two point function and extract the most of the science from this. And for WMAP and for Planck, the fluctuations are Gaussian on those scales. And that was the right tool. But when we look at observations of large scale structure, and also when we look at the observations of the foregrounds, we're looking at measurements that are highly non-Gaussian. We don't have the right form of the likelihood function. Tools like likelihood free inference, I think will be the kinds of tools we will want to use. Um, I'll note that the science collaborations themselves, if you ask the Euclid team or the Roman teams or the Vera Rubin Vera Dark Energy Survey collaboration, what tools they're using, they're using the two point functions because they have to meet requirements for it from, that come from management and management wants things you understand, not things that you have to work on as the data comes in. And as my hat as a manager, I understand that. But I think that's where the exciting opportunity is. We know that there's more information. We know in the large scale uh, structure surveys, there's factors of several more information in higher point statistics and on smaller scales where things are um, somewhat nonlinear. And if we can forward model the data, use things like likelihood free inference, I think we have the opportunity to extract much more information from these surveys. Now, this will require um, understanding how to properly incorporate the uncertainties and systematics in our data in the forward modeling and in our machine learning, right? We will be modeling, we're looking at uh, foregrounds, we will be modeling them and have to prop forward model our uncertainties. If we're looking at large scale structure, the biggest uncertainties come from our limited understanding of the physics of star formation and feedback and feedback from AGNs. And we will need to marginalize over those uncertainties. Um, I think this is a surmountable problem, but a non-trivial one. And uh, for me personally, this is actually the direction I, that I plan to work on in the coming years. Uh, Sergei Petkov asks, uh, what will be, according to you, the time scale for the termination of the neutrino mass ordering uh, or hierarchy?
I am hopeful that we can do this within five years. You know, I think if we look at having much of the DESI data or the first year of VRO data plus the first year of Euclid data, um, if we rely only on two point statistics, that will not be enough. But if we can combine on that time scale, so 2026, um, we should have the first, gener first year or two's worth of data available from Simon's Observatory, from Euclid, Euclid's first release, uh, VRO's first release. And if we use higher point statistics, things like void statistics, um, three point statistics, um, we should have enough information to make a, uh, I believe a five sigma detection of neutrino mass and determine the hierarchy. One, one question if, uh, if the audience may, may hear. Um, so um, the, the number of probes um, which, uh, which represent the avenues that you would have set for, for cosmology uh, is, is impressive. And, and it it's certainly, certainly creates a so, so, so also a sociological challenge for, for cosmology as well. Um, so I'm hearing, I'm curious to hear your impression about that. But uh, before coming to that question, um, precisely for the complexity of the measurement that you were outlining, in terms of catching the last signal very close to the Big Bang in terms of cosmological gravitational waves, how do you see, how do you assign the importance of having an instrument from space in a couple of years that complements the, the, the efforts from the ground like the Simons Observatory? So we have a we have a proposal which is uh, which is lighter, but to well, say satellite which is which is uh, pretty much advanced in the, in, the, in the let's say in the design and implementation and gathering resources. How do you do you see the relevance of that? Um, so let me answer your first question first, and okay. then the second question. So uh, there will be sociological complexities in combining different experiments from different teams. But I think the science makes it worthwhile. Mm -hmm. And for me, the model is actually comes from the multi messenger work on gravitational waves. And when the neutron star neutron star collision was seen, I think there's a paper with 2000 authors and at least a dozen different collaborations from different telescopes that all combine their data together to produce a truly remarkable result that uh, revealed the origin of gold and platinum by telling us about our process elements coming from neutron stars, but also gave us some very interesting constraints on fundamental physics by showing us that gravitational waves and photons arrived at the same time. So I'm hopeful that we'll be able to combine the data sets. Now, I think realistically, my experience with collaborations like this is before the data arrives, everyone is paranoid about other people stealing their science. No one wants to let anyone else in. Once the data comes, there's so much to do. And there's so much to do to carry out the original program is challenging enough that other people coming in to look at the data and get new things from it is a bonus. Now, whether at the end, you know, I chose 2026 because I think that pushes me after the first public release of almost all those data sets, at which point it could just be done. And then, but to do it well, will actually require um, input from all of the teams because one really needs to understand how the measurements are made. So that's what we'll, we'll see how we go, go there. Uh, the second question about the role of space observations uh, for polarization is, I think one of the things we've seen is that from the ground, because the atmosphere is not very polarized, we can measure small angular scales well from the ground. So I think we will certainly be able to achieve our goals on the ground at high multiples. There'll be some limit at which ground-based systematics become important. 
probably angular scales pessimistically uh, a degree, optimistically three degrees, somewhere in that range, systematics will come in. If we want to get to the large angles and really see that the gravitational wave signal is scale invariant and the properties and perhaps achieve higher sensitivity, then uh, we need to go to space. And certainly to see the signal from reionization uh, and to characterize it accurately, or the EE modes of Planckacine, uh, those will uh, require a space based mission. So there are different approaches people have taken. So I think we need a space based mission. There's a, the, the approach that the Lightbird team has taken. Um, which in some ways is more conservative and says, let's do from space only what needs to be done from space. Let's only look at the kind of degree scale, half degree scale larger. So there'll be overlap with ground. They'll be able to confirm each other, but you will lie on the ground measurements for the fine details and have space fill in the region it sees. So it'll give us a kind of between White Bird and Simon's Observatory will get a more complete picture. And then there's a more ambitious and hence more expensive program where you say from space, we should do everything. And uh, that program, which was the, being pursued by, by PICO in the US and CORE and its, and its descendants here in Europe, um, leads to a more ambitious, more expensive mission. And uh, the nice thing, and this was our experience with WMAP, if you do something that's smaller and simpler, you can do it faster. And, you know, I'm like all of us, I'm getting older. So I'd like to see the results. So I, I'm more excited about uh, the light bird option personally. Thank you. More questions? Yes, one is uh, from Sarah Motalebi. She asks, uh, if we consider the possibility that uh, our universe was originated from a black hole interior, how can we explain the primordial fluctuations? I mean, how would the origin of fluctuation would be if Big Bang uh, was a black hole? Thank you for your talk. Hmm. So I think uh, in the inflationary universe model, we do not live in, uh, well, to be careful, we do not need to live inside the interior of a black hole. Now, there are, uh, people see the black hole. Okay, we can tell them a bit. <laughs> okay, so I'll try to sketch this picture. These are these bubble nucleation models that Alan Guth and others developed in which our universe looks like a little bubble that nucleates out of a proto-universe. From the outside, from outside our universe, it would look as if it's like a black hole, but inside we detach from it, you become causally disconnected from uh, this meta universe in this bubble nucleation model. And um, then you actually do look like a black hole from the outside. And we live inside this expanded bubble. Um, all these pictures require, have, and understanding this ultimately requires having a theory of quantum cosmology and the theory of quantum gravity. And this is something that right now is venturing into an area of physics where our understanding is very incomplete. Our string theory colleagues have made many steps in trying to understand this, but they still do not have a dynamical theory of quantum gravity that lets them make these kinds of, you know, so we have classical pictures that sketch this out. But once we get to these kinds of questions, we are really getting into areas of enormous speculation. 
That said, that's what makes this in some ways so exciting. Because if we were to see gravitational waves, this would be probing physics involved with these early moments. And whether one saw, I mean, uh, to be truly ambitious and optimistic, one could imagine seeing not only gravitational waves, but non-Gaussian aides associated with gravitational waves. And there's been a whole series of theoretical papers that have shown the potential sensitivity of that to the details of early universe physics. Okay, there is the last one from Esteban Chalbo. Uh, we will see in the nearby future an improvement concerning secondary anisotropy. Oh. If that is the case, what is the, the situation there? Oh, I think we will see tremendous improvements. Um, so secondary anisotropies, among them are the signal coming from clusters. So uh, with our latest release from ACT, we've seen about 2,000 clusters. I, the data that we have in hand that we are analyzing already will double that because we will increase sensitivity. With Simon's observatory, we will more, double it yet again, do even more, more like 20,000 clusters. So we'll see enormous, you know, order of magnitude improvement in what we've learned from the clusters. And what's very nice of this is this is the same clusters that we see their shadows against the microwave sky with thermal SE and measure the integrated pressure in the clusters um, will be observed in the X-ray by Eurozita and will be traced by the distribution of galaxies by DESI. And their, their masses will be measured by lensing by uh, Euclid and Roman. And we will get a very comprehensive picture. That, by the way, those combinations, just taking the clusters measured with Simon's observatory, weighing them by a combination of optical lensing measurements from Euclid and CMB lensing measurements from the Simon's observatory data, will actually give us an independent measurement of neutrino mass um, distinct from the other techniques we've talked about. So that's one of the things we hope to learn from secondary anisotropies. Another secondary anisotropy that we've seen, well, gravitational lens in the CMB is a sense one, and we'll measure that with much higher precision, signal to noise of close to 200. Um, and that will measure the distribution of mass in the visible universe. So we'll get the distribution of pressure, the distribution of mass, and through the kinematics and Yezovodovich effect, the distribution of momentum. And well, my original plan for 2020 was I was going to be here at CISA for a meeting, bringing together people from Euclid and the Simons Observatory. And one of the things that excited me most about that combination was the ability to study these secondary anisotropies, to cross correlate the distribution of a spectroscopic sample you'd, one would measure from Euclid with the CMB kinetic uh, momentum signal, the KSC signal from uh, the Simons Observatory. And uh, well, something intervened and that meant April 2020 was not a good time to travel and visit. Um, nevertheless, these surveys will go forward and we will get that data and we will make those measurements. And uh, she looked forward uh, to returning to Trieste for uh, that long delayed meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I think uh, we can we can thank uh, everybody for for the kind attention and the very interesting question and we thank david for being here and to for uh, giving this uh, illuminating colloquium at CISA. okay so thank you everybody and uh, talk to you soon about all these topics okay.